Shalom, this is Pastor Roy Blight. I'm the pastor here at Messiah House in Lake Worth, Florida, and today is Torah Tuesday, and we're looking now at the number two Torah portion today. We're talking about Noah, or as in the Hebrew, it's Noah, and we want, as we look at it today, remember Noah, it's all about new beginnings. He saw the judgment of God, and he, he saw the new creation of God after the flood, and we want to get right into this right now because we're going to be discussing the favor of God, so let's get right into it right now. So as we discuss our Torah portions, remember that we are always looking for God's truth in these. There's a lot of deep meaning truths, and we're looking today at the favor of God. We're going to be getting in the New Covenant, as we always do, and work our way back through the original Torah portion that they've been teaching for centuries. And we want to look at the, the principles. We want to look at what the message is that God really wants us to hear as we look at it. So today we're looking at the favor of God. We're looking at Noah and the things that have to do with Noah. It says in Psalm 29 to 10, 11, the Lord rules over the floodwaters. The Lord reigns as king forever. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses them with peace. Praise God. That's us. That's the favor of the Lord. It says in Psalm 30, verse 5, For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. And we want to keep that in mind. So we want to understand as we begin the New Covenant portion that it, we're looking at four different areas in the New Covenant. Matthew chapter 24, Luke 17, 1 Peter 3, and Hebrews chapter 11. As we delve into the subject today of the favor of God, the favor of the Lord. Now, it says in Hebrews 11, 7, by faith, remember the just shall live by faith. This is a scriptural principle throughout the scriptures from Genesis all the way through Revelation. It says, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So our righteousness is in Jesus. Our righteousness is Jesus. And we have this righteousness because we have faith in Jesus. Noah is depicted as a hero of faith here in the book of Hebrews. And it's to keep in mind that ever, anybody that ever did anything for the Lord were people of faith. Because of his faith, he saves himself, his family, humankind. He found God's favor and he became an heir of eternal life with all who put their faith in Yeshua, in Jesus Christ. So we want to understand that everything is done by faith, and Noah was a great example of the faith. Now let's jump to Matthew 24 here, looking at the Olivet Discourse, which we do a lot on our channels on the season of the Shofar and in our Torah portions. In Matthew 24, 37, it says, As in the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Now, the phrase days of Noah elicits a picture of the idolatrous and sinful conditions of the world that prevailed before the flood and will return just before the coming of the Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, at the time of the great tribulation upon the earth. In Genesis 6, 12, it says that before the flood, it says, God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways very similar to the days we're living in right now. In fact, here's what it says in Matthew 24, beginning of 37. As were the days of Noah, so will the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage without much thought. Until the day when, the, when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away so will be the coming of the Son of Man. So we understand that the days that, that Noah was living in are days that required faith. Even though everybody in the world was running in a different direction, Noah kept his faith in the Lord. He wasn't swayed by the numbers of people or anything else, only by what the word of the Lord was telling him. And so as it is, as in the days of Noah, so we live right now. Surely in our postmodern world, we're living in the days of Noah. Idolatrous practices abound, 
And by merely reading the daily news, we can see that every intention of the thoughts of man's heart is only evil continually in every direction all the time. We live in a new pagan dark age that is centered upon selfishness and violence and it is very separate from the Lord. The coming of the Lord Yeshua will come suddenly and without warning to an unwatching generation. Indeed, it will come as, quote unquote, a thief in the night. And while people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. That's what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. Now, since it's generally conceded that the time of the Great Tribulation will be anything but a time of peace and security, the illusions made by the Master and the Apostle Paul point to something quite different than a post-tribulational appearance of Yeshua in Jerusalem at the end of worldwide chaos. As God, as God called righteous Noah into the ark, and seven days later the flood came, so those declared righteous by the grace of Jehovah will be raptured out of the wickedness of the surrounding world and thus spared from the time of wrath by means of this incredible event. Noah, in fact, when the rapture happens, that is when the wrath of God begins on planet Earth. There's going to be a lot of hell before then, but the wrath of God is God's wrath on Earth, and that begins at the rapture. Noah and the ark represent a type of the rapture, the day of the Lord, set to occur in the end time of the seven-year tribulation. And it says in Revelation 3.10, Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial. This is that time of the wrath of God. This is after the rapture. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. This is going to be, the, the hour of trial is going to be the time when Jesus is here and you will have to make a choice. Unlike those upon whom the day of Jehovah comes like a thief, the Lord Yeshua stated there will be those who will escape the catastrophic events that occurred during the Great Tribulation. You, this is the day of the Lord, when the Lord takes the saints home, the rapture. You can be one of them if you put your complete trust in his sheltering love. No matter what your thoughts are on the matter, whatever your theories are on when it's going to happen, your heart needs to be completely in Jesus to make sure that you're going to go home when it's time to go home. Luke 18, 8 says, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? And this is really the key. When No matter how dark it gets outside, do you see the light? Do you have faith in Jesus during this time of great darkness that's coming on the earth and indeed is already on the earth? And remember, Jesus said, I am coming quickly. And he's going to take many, many, many by surprise. You don't have to let that happen to you. You need to walk in faith, and you need to walk in faith right now. So we're looking at the time of the end here about Noah, and we're, we're focusing in on the things that are spoken to us by Jesus himself, because he's the one who said, no one knows when, how, when and how, but the Father in heaven. So you can't take for granted that you know when the rapture is going to be. You can't take for granted you know when your day of, of going home in death is going to be. You need to understand that the the Time is the end is going to come suddenly, especially on those who are not watching. It says in Matthew 24, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So understand, this is a very clear message to the church in the last days, to be on your guard, to be ready. It says in Matthew 24, 45, Who then is a faithful and wise servant? whom his master made ruler over his household, to give them food in due season. Blessed is that servant, whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. 
So this is who we need to be. We need to be living in the kingdom of God now to make sure that when the time comes, we're living in the kingdom of God. The, the coming of the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus said, but if I drive, this is in Luke eleven twenty. it's interesting. It, Jesus said, but if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. When you see all these things prevailing, when you're seeing spiritual warfare all around you, the kingdom of God is here, and the kingdom of God has come to you. You need to understand the warfare you are actually in. Look what it says here in, in Luke chapter 17. Starting in verse 20, it says, Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. He's speaking about you spiritually and me spiritually. Has the kingdom of God come to you yet? Do you live in the kingdom of God? Then he said to the disciples, The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look here or look there. Do not go after them or follow them. It's talking about the days when there's going to be false messiahs and false Christs out there. Stay away from that mess. For Jesus said, for when the Son of Man returns, you will know it beyond all doubt. It will be as evident as the lightning that flashes across the sky. Every eye is going to behold him. He says, but first he must suffer many things, talking about Jesus, and be rejected by this generation. That was the current generation that Yeshua was living in. And as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Judgment came, Noah was prepared, and Noah's family was prepared, and nobody else was, and they all died in the cataclysm that came upon planet Earth in the flood. So these are things that we need to understand when it says, it, as it was in the days of Noah, this was a day of great judgment when you discuss the, what happened with Noah. The earth, complete earth, all the earth was judged. Paul wrote to the Colossians, and this is great advice for us today. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along, its, along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. We need to be focused on doing the will of God and bearing good fruit so that we will abide with him forever. This is, our, this is our destiny. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, why work so hard to fit in when you were called to be set apart? And this is great advice for the believer today. We need to be set apart for God's work, not trying to blend into a, a lost culture like many people seem to want to do. The apostle Peter wrote, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, Arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he was for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles or pagans, when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Of course, your, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things that they do. So they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God, who stands ready to judge everyone, both the living and the dead. God is our judge, not your friends. So understand that you need to make a choice. And your messianic application for today is separating yourself from the world or not. You have been set apart and chosen for his purpose. It tells us in the Torah, in Deuteronomy 14, you have been set apart and chosen for his purpose, not your purpose, 
his purpose. If I'm having difficult times, does that mean that I have unforgiven sin or lack of faith? No. Look what it said in 1 John chapter 3, it says, Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. <coughs> Excuse me. Noah went through difficult times. He was faithful in his ministry, even though it had little effect. In the end, he and his family were saved. They passed through the waters of the flood to a new life. They did. Nobody else did. It says in Hebrews eleven seven. 7. Again, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. So we need to understand uh, this 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 uh, for this form of life where we we should be dying to live, as it says in Peter. It says, "For it is better to suffer unjustly for doing right, if that should be God's will, than to suffer justly for doing wrong." We need to understand that in God's economy, it's completely different than man's. Peter said, "For Messiah also suffered once for sins." the just for the unjust, that he might bring to us bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. Now, while Yeshua's body was in the grave, his spirit went into the earth, and preached to the same people Noah had preached to in his day, and many more, of course. So understand that the same people are being talked to. Noah offered them a way to escape the flood waters by returning to Jehovah. Yeshua offered them a way to escape death and hell by believing in him, and he brought them forth. It's, it says in verse 21, there's also an antitype, a figure that copies the pattern of a previous thing, which now saves us, and that pattern is baptism. Not, and, and it's not the removal of the filth of the flesh. That's not the purpose of baptism. Neither is escaping further contact with the world and its lust, the purpose of dying to the old man, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Yeshua HaMashiach. How is your conscience today before the Lord? If it's if it's about how good you are, you've missed it. Because our conscience, good conscience before the Lord is our relationship with the Son of God, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. In verse 22, it says, Who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Yeshua suffered. People did not always respond well to his ministry. In the eyes of man, he was not successful. But look where he is now. And we have to understand that this is precisely the center of all the, of our faith. Romans 6.3 says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You see, we are to be set apart. We are to die out to this world, just like Jesus died for us. We were buried there. It says Romans 6.4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in death, like him, we shall certainly be united with him in the resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that, so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Sin is an enslaving power. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with Christ. 
So we must take on the, the yoke of looking and being and, and abiding in Jesus Christ. Paul wrote, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. So this is what we need to understand today. This is what our faith takes us to today, our life in Jesus, the Messiah. And Paul wrote, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He was always moving toward the Lord. He was moving toward the Lord every day, trying to become closer and closer with him. And, and Philippians, it says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. So that ends our, our, our new covenant part of this uh, taking on or looking at the favor of God in our lives, which we only get through faith in Jesus the Messiah. But it brings us right smack dead center in the into the subject of the favor of God as we see it in the life of Noah. So let's get into the original Torah portion here today and see the exact same concepts that we were just studying in the new covenant. And this is our second parasha. This is Noah, or in Hebrew, Noah. And we're looking at the, the life and the story of Noah. And this is Genesis 6, 9 to eleven thirty two. 32. Secular scholars often scoff at the story of the flood, suggesting it as is a myth. But several ancient documents reveal striking parallels to the account given in the Torah. The most famous of these is the Babylonian Gilgamesh epic, which was a poem, an ancient poem from ancient Mesopotamia. Moreover, sea archaeologists have discovered numerous ancient submerged cities throughout the world that lend credibility to the account we find in the Bible. And there's all kinds of archaeological evidence for the flood in every culture. They have a myth concerning the flood. Now, the second reading in the book of Genesis, which we know is the word of God, is named after Noah. In Hebrew, the name Noah is spelled with a het at the end and, and is pronounced Noah. Noah's name comes from the Hebrew verb noach, meaning to rest. He was so named by his father Lamech, who said, Out of the ground that Jehovah has cursed, this one shall bring us relief or rest from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. This is found in Genesis 5.29. As such, Noah is a type of Messiah who saves the world and gives comfort and rest. And we see this in this genealogy. We see the gospel of Jesus Christ actually given to us in the names of the lineage from Noah going back all the way through Adam. You had Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. These eight generations of of, of men of God, these generations, you put their names together, and it spells, and it gives you the gospel, man appointed mortal sorrow, the blessed God shall come down teaching, his death shall bring the despairing rest and comfort. That's perfectly in line with what the gospel is all about today. Shouldn't be any wonder to us, God is perfect in all that he says and do, does. Now let's look at Genesis chapter 6. Parashah Noah tells the story of Noah's flood, the Tower of Babel, and the beginning of the Abrahamic line. Last week in Bereshit showed how the fall of Adam and Eve caused humanity to plunge into sin and idolatrous chaos which ensued upon the earth. And we see now that, that years, hundreds of years later, we look at Adam's line. Remember, Cain killed Abel and his line was cut off. And Ab or Cain's line was, was an evil line. Abel was cut off. And then Seth. Noah comes from the line of Seth. And in Parashah Bereshit is described some of the wretched offspring of the line of Canaan. And some of them are of the same names even. 
but it then turns the focus on Seth, which means compensation, the third son of Adam and Eve, whose descendants began to call upon the name of Jehovah. Seth had a son named Enosh, which means man, making Noah a clear picture of the coming Bar Enosh, or son of man. So all of these names matter, and when you see it in Hebrew, it becomes even more profound. But understand, God is perfect, and God's word is perfect too. In Daniel 7, 13 and 14, it says this about the Son of Man. This is a very important messianic title given because Jesus is the Son of Man. And this goes all the way back to the genealogy and the meaning of the words and the names and the meaning of the names. It says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the cause of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and, and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one shall that shall not be destroyed. That's talking about the coming Messiah, coming a second time. So we see this is perfectly in line with what we're looking at being rescued by the Lord. Now, the wicked generations of Cain and the ungodly mixture of the human and the demonic fallen angels through the Nephilim and the Watchers caused the world to be entirely steeped in anarchy and bloodlust so that every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. And this went on for a long time during the days of from Adam to Noah. In Genesis 6, 5, it says, Then Jehovah saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. After nine generations, Jehovah had had enough and was ready to wipe humanity from the face of the earth. However, God recognized Noah from the godly line of Seth as a Sadiq, a righteous man, and graciously made provision to save him from the wrath to come. Noah and his human family. Remember, people were becoming hybrids in those days, and they were no longer human. Noah was still 100% human. And Noah was also, we know, as was a preacher of righteousness. The parasha opens with the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. He was blameless in his generations, and he walked with God. Now, Noah has a lot in common with the Messiah, and he's a type of the Messiah. The Torah story of Noah and the flood illustrates a couple things here. One, the human condition of mankind, man's sin, God's reaction to it, the horror of divine judgment, and the need for salvation for mankind. Noah, as a type of the Messiah, was the savior of the world. Everybody else perished. So we see that this is a, a very deep and complex subject matter, but actually it's very simple because he's a type, shadow, and pattern of who the Messiah was to be. He was the Savior of the world. Peter wrote, God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. In the days of Noah, the Almighty brought up a charge against the whole world. The whole world was corrupt, and God was ready to act. But Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Noah proclaimed a message of repentance to a wicked and adulterous generation. The apostles called him a quote-unquote preacher of righteousness, who called his generation to repent. He warned the people of his time about an imminent day of divine fury and judgment. Noah offered men as a means of deliverance through which they could be saved from the fate about to befall the generation. And we see this was the flood. In Genesis 6, 13, it starts out, And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. Now, in our Torah portion, God reveals to Noah his intention to destroy all the inhabitants of the earth 
with a great and worldwide flood, a mabul in Hebrew, and instructs him to build a 450 foot long, three tiered wooden ark and to daub it or cover it both inside and out with pitch, which is reason. Genesis 7 1 says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and all your household, for I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Now Noah took his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives, and two male and female of every sort of unclean animal and seven of every clean animal into the ark to be sheltered from the coming deluge. So Noah with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh, which is the breath of life, in, in which is the breath of life, so that so those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and Jehovah shut him in. Now in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, all the foundations of the great deep burst forth, and the rain began and continued to fall for 40 days and nights. So there was water coming up out of the earth and water falling down onto the earth. And it was flooding everything. And this went on for 40 days and 40 nights. And when we look at the chronology of all of this, it's pretty amazing to behold. But this was the flood. This was the great turning point of the history of mankind. The waters eventually covered the entire earth, overwhelming even the tops of the highest mountains. And it says in verse 21, And all flesh died that moved on the earth birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man and in those and and all in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life all that was on the dry land died the flood destroyed and killed everybody remember it says in genesis 8 1 but god remembered noah now verse 2 says the fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained, and the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of 150 days, the waters decreased. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat, which is in Turkey. And we see that the, this history is, is it begins and ends with the flood of Noah. It ended for so many, but it also began what we know as our modern history today. After 150 days, the water began to recede, and on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on Mount Ararat, it says. So we see this entire chronology, chronology is laid out for us, and it's an amazing thing to behold. From its perch, Noah dispatched a raven and then a series of doves to see if the waters were abated from the face of the earth. Seven months later, in the 600 in the 601st year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, after a stay of one year and 11 days, about a complete solar year, then the ground was finally dry. And we see that all of these happened. Keep in mind, we're not sure exactly what every day portends, but notice the specificity, I think I got that right, of the days that are here, and you will see that everything looks to be laid out perfectly before us. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife, and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and cattle, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that they may abound on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So we see that this all happened, that Noah and his family let out all those animals, and they all spread around the earth. In Genesis 8, 20, it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. 
As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. So you know, Jehovah removed the curse from the ground after Noah built an altar and offered sacrifices. And we see that in the scripture, altar builders in the Bible are very prevalent. And we want to look at this. We often find in scripture, when a man moves to a new place, he builds an altar. After these altars, after all, these altars were memorials, a way of saying, when I was here, I worshiped Jehovah, the creator of the universe. Even in the prophets, altars are used as a way for people to acknowledge that Jehovah is their God, and Jehovah looks upon them with favor, those that have built the altars. So we see this is one of the amazing things. Look what it says here in Isaiah 19.20. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord. This is talking about the, the second coming of the Messiah here, the day of the Lord. It will be a sign and a witness to the Lord of hosts in the day in the land of Egypt. When they cry out to the Lord because of their oppressors, he will send them a savior and defender to rescue them. Now, pagans had their altars where they sacrificed offerings and called on their gods, hoping in vain to obtain favor. These altars were often on mountains or hills. When God would have his people take the land, he would ordain, ordain his altar on his holy mountain, the one and only place they were to expect that he would accept offerings from his people. The priest, it says, the priest shall burn them on the altar as food and offering made by fire for a sweet aroma. All the fat is Jehovah's. In Psalm 50, it says, sacrifice, thank offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High and call on me in the days of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. This is God's will for his people, that in those days they built altars before him. Our altar needs to be in our heart right now. As we continue week by week studying Torah, we will find altars mentioned. And even in today's Haftor portion, there's a prophecy that we might have overlooked if we didn't know to relate it to the use of altars. See if you catch it once we get there. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And so we see that this is the Noah covenant. And a covenant is a bond between two or more parties. And each party entering into the covenant accepts certain terms of the covenant, promises he agrees to keep. The specific commandments given to B'nai Noah, the sons of Noah, are detailed in Genesis chapter 9, but may be summoned, summarized as follows. One, the command to be fruitful and multiply. Two, the prohibition against eating blood. Three, the prohibition of murder and the institution of capital punishment. God was making the distinction between men and animals more obvious. And the terms of the, the Noah covenant is Jehovah's terms and our terms. Animals would fear man. God would not send another flood to destroy the whole earth. And the token that God gave in his part of the covenant was the rainbow. And for us as people, we, are, we, we needed to obtain from meat eating. Meat eating was per, permitted, but no blood could be eaten. Man is created in God's image, which, which is not to be uh, marred or destroyed, and we are not to shed man's blood. That was the Noah covenant. It says in verse 4, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of a man, of man. Whoever sheds man's blood by man, his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you and with every living creature that is with you. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all, will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. So for the first time, God made covenant with man. To seal the covenant, God shared the food from his table with man. As part of the new bond, 
God offered to man the right to eat meat, the food that, that had up to this time been reserved for offerings to God on the altar. The blood was not to be eaten. It was to be, it was to be spilled on the ground, joining the blood of Abel, waiting for the true atonement. True atonement, life from the dead, freedom from sin, and kingdom life could only come through the blood of the one who is to come. There is life in no other. The taking of the cup of joy, quote unquote, the true union would, would be ours when we would come to make covenant with us through the sacrifice of himself on the cross by Jesus. In Matthew 26, it says, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. So we're talking about this, this uh, commitment between God and man through the drink. It says in John 6, do you remember what Jesus said? Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And now we're, we're being exposed to a better covenant with better promises, as we're told in Scripture. In Genesis 9:12, it says, And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. So we're looking at the rainbow, and the rainbow is is the, is the cloud, and it's it's something that God has given to mankind. Jehovah made covenant with Noah, his descendants, and all flesh never again to destroy the earth with a flood, and gave the rainbow as the sign of the covenant, a natural memorial to Jehovah. And we see all this that happens. We look at it, we're amazed at it. There's, there, the steps that are involved in the formation of a rainbow are interesting. Light from sun strikes a raindrop. Some of the light is reflected. The rest of the light is refracted. White light splits into component colors. Light is refracted again as it leaves raindrop, and the colors are further dispersed. When light ref refracts, it breaks into a spectrum of seven colors, as in the rainbow. Pretty amazing. God's spirit is also a sevenfold spirit. It has seven aspects. God took his sevenfold spirit and put him in his son, and the spirit was with him as he ministered as the light of the world. It says in, this, in Isaiah 11, 2, And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, and the spirit of wisdom and understanding, and the spirit of counsel and might, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us just like the rainbow is a token of God's covenant of what he did with Noah after the flood. <laughs> Excuse me. Jesus said this in Matthew 5, let your light so shine before men that you may see your, that, that, that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These were the three sons of Noah, and from them came the people who were scattered over the whole earth. And we see there are many, many maps showing you where the sons of Noah went. The parasha then explains the early life of the survivors. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. As Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside, says in Genesis 9. According to various scholars, Ham saw his father's nakedness meant that Noah's sons either slept with Noah's wife or sexually assaulted Noah himself. Perhaps this is all open to conjecture. In Leviticus 18, it says, None of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. 
I am Jehovah. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife you shall not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. So we see this all had to do with some kind of uh, wrongful exposure by Ham. In a future Torah portion, we'll read about Korah, who thought he had more of a right to lead God's people than Moses and Aaron had. Korah's rebellion ended in him and all of his fathers being swallowed up by the earth. Perhaps the same kind of rebellion was what was going on with Ham. Since he found Noah had, had something to be ashamed of, he might have thought Noah should hand over the headship of the family and the nation to the next in line. Since Noah had apparently fallen from grace, scripture doesn't really make it clear. We know what Ham did, though, was wrong. And it says in uh, Matthew, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him. His fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Now, above, Peter said, above all, keep love, loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Ham betrayed his father's trust. Noah cursed Ham. What was the right, what? Was that the right thing for him to do? Ham told his brothers about their father's secret. Noah cursed Ham's son, Canaan, though he blessed Shem and Japheth, who covered the nakedness of their father. So we see something that's going on here. And this is important because it has affected all of humankind since then. We're to walk as children of light. If people mistreat or malign you, bless them. We're to be speaking blessing and not cursing one another. Always speak blessings and not curses. Those We don't want to get involved with cursing anybody. We want to walk in blessing. Job, for example, was a righteous man. If one of Job's son had messed up, what would Job have done? Well, he would have blessed him. It says in Job 1.1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. And his sons went and feasted in their houses every one of his days and sent and called for their, their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. He was afraid of his son's cursing God. So he went and put a blessing out there to cover for his sons and his daughters. Job, as priest of his family, covered the sins of his children by blessing them, by covering their curses. We do this through intercession when we pray. We cover the sins of our brothers and sisters. We say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yeshua does this when he intercedes for us with his blood on the heavenly altar. He covers our shame with his blood. It says in 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. Noah lived a total of 950 years, and then he died. This is in Genesis chapter 9. So we see the, the table of the nations given in Genesis chapter 10 with, jo, with uh, Noah's sons of Japheth, who had seven sons, Ham had four sons, and Shem had five sons. And they, they traveled about, and they, they settled all around the globe. And we see that all three of them are represented in the Middle East even today, which has tremendous ramifications for all of us. After the curse of Canaan, the parasha describes how the earth was repopulated through Noah's three sons as the founders of the 70 nations of the Gentiles, as described in the detailed genealogy of Genesis chapter 10, the table of the nations. And we see this is laid out very thoroughly. And the, the, the descendants of Noah remained a single people group with a single language for five generations. And we see that they, there was one language in the land. And then we come to the, the situation at the Tower of Babel. However, 
the people, they eventually returned to the evil ways of the sons of Cain, if you remember back way back in the days of Cain and Abel, by uniting in an idolatrous religion that led them to build a tower with its top in the heavens, quote, unquote. And this is, gets us into Genesis 11, talking about the Tower of Babel. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And we, this is the rise of Nimrod, the rebel against the Lord. And the kingdom of Nimrod is spoken of here. And they said, come and let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. If the people should be scattered, what were the leaders afraid they would lose? Power over the people. What is politics? This is, this is exactly what it's talking about. Politics is the process of who gets what, when, and how, according to Harold Laswell. The econ economics of interaction and conflict resolution, distribution of resources, tangible and human, through the currency of influence, desire to obtain wealth, prestige, and security. God confounded their evil religion, this Babylonian Nimrod religion, mystery Babylon, if you will, by confusing their speech, and thereby dispersed the people into the 70 nations of the earth. They abandoned, the abandoned tower was called Babel, and is considered by many to be the origin of mystery Babylon. It's all right here in the land of Shinar. It says in Galatians 1, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what you have preached to you, of what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. You see, as we have said before, so this is the words of Paul. As we have said before, so say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel, which is good news, contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So this whole thing at the Tower of Babel, God came down, and this is where the, all the languages of the world came from. Before Babel, everybody spoke the same language. Nimrod was a grandson of Noah, and he was known as a great hunter on the plains of Shinar, modern-day Iraq or Mesopotamia. He was the great rebel who stood against the creator, the God of the Bible. Nimrod's instructions had been explicit. The plans had been executed perfectly to the minutest detail, and now the magnificent tower that would serve as Cadillac, Cad, catalyst to both the culture and technology of the not-too-distant past was becoming a reality. The structure was not simply a work of stone and mortar, but also represented something esoterically spiritual and deeply religious. <clears throat> this religion, the ancient wisdom of the watchers, contained beliefs and doctrines of the old ones, quote unquote, and the ingredients for the restoration of an earlier age of giants commingling with humans that was washed away in the, in the annihilating waters of the judgment of God. This is still, to this day, this is the, the religion of the secret societies, of the Masons and so forth. Now, the great hunter was on the very precipice of proving that a united, motivated, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry, an esoterically empowered human race could accomplish anything. Even if such an accomplishment was diametrically opposed to the plan of God for humanity. With these thoughts flowing through the consciousness Nimrod, <clears throat> Nimrod basked in the pure euphoria <clears throat> let me start here I, excuse me with these thoughts flowing through the consciousness Nimrod basked in the pure euphoria of personal achievement. However, this very day, God himself would not only thwart his ambitious plans of a world empire, 
but would also deny the imminent appearance of a single universal religion that would accompany any such spiritual, occultic, and political aspiration. Sorry about that. I want to uh, get back to Noah here or get back to Nimrod. Nimrod was was a rebel before the Lord and the Lord took everything that they were doing and he confused it. God himself would not only thwart Nimrod's ambitious plans of a world empire, but would also deny the imminent appearance of a single universal religion that would accompany any such spiritual, occultic, and political aspiration. <clears throat> and this happened all the way, actually, till 2017. But that's not the subject we're going to get into there today. So let's look at a little bit at what happened at the Tower of Babel. We see that all the languages were mixed. It says, but Jehovah came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And Jehovah said, Indeed, the people are one, as they all have one language, and this is what they began to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So Jehovah scattered them abroad with their from there over the face of the all, all of the earth, and they ceased building the city, the city of Babylon. Now Elohim, God, Jehovah, confused the languages of man. The construction stopped, and the lofty dreams of Nimrod were shattered. However, even with his subsequent death and esoteric religion, the mystery Babylonian religion, Nimrod espoused would live on all the way up until today, and it is still very much alive today, all around the globe, and has infiltrated every religion pretty much. With the help of Nimrod's widow and her illegitimate son, Semiramis and Tammuz, the ancient wisdom would be carefully preserved in the Babylonian mystery religions. As the followers of Nimrod scattered across the face of the earth, the ancient mysteries accompanied them from Egypt to China and even to the Americas and every place in between. And this is known as, quote, unquote, the ancient wisdom, which is very occultic, very esoteric, very witchy. With the passing of time, the ancient wisdom came to be guarded by the elite wise persons, quote unquote, of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Pergamos, and Rome. It later found a home in Eastern religions, the Jewish Kabbalah and Western Gnosticism. This spiritual battle is the theme in scripture of the great tribulation and the battle being waged to this very day, just as it was in the days of Noah. And we see this in the architecture. We see this in the buildings. We see this in the intentional uh, building of some of the buildings, even in Europe today. The rebellion that resist, that that lived in the heart of Nimrod is in the heart of the people even today. And this going, this Babylonian mystery religion, this Babel, this rebellion against God continues to this day. And those, and we, we can draw a line right back to the flood. When all of this be began, and you go right to the Tower of Babel, and you find that you see that God has dealt with this before, and the day and the days of Noah were days of a great ending, a great beginning, but some of the sinfulness of man has just never gone away. The parasha of Noah concludes with the genealogy of the generations from Noah to Terah. Terah was a Chaldean who was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And we'll see how people's lifespan shortened after the flood through this chart that we have here. And things change very dramatically after the flood. And it says, And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, remember, after this is in the days of Joseph. <laughs> and Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers, 
in the days of their pilgrimage. He was speaking of life before the flood of his fathers and how long that they lived. Remember, Noah himself, who lived before and after the flood, lived well into his 600s. And so we see even uh, Shem uh, actually lived after Abraham. Just as there were 10 generations from Adam to Noah, so there were 10 generations from Noah to Abram, the father of the Jewish people and the people of the faith, the chosen people. And we see this in Terah's family tree as well, how all of this spread about. Haran died in the city of Ur, but he had a son named Lot, who was made part of Terah's extended family. And then Mar Abram married Sarai. It says, but Sarah, <coughs> but Sarai was barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son Abram's wife. And they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And <coughs> Excuse me very much. And they came to the land and they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So we see the, the life and journey of Abraham is, is given to us. These were the descendants of Noah's son, Shem. And we see the genealogy of Shem. Here we once again see Jehovah preparing the lineage for the promised seed to come. The Mashiach and the Savior of the world came through this line. And we see this is, goes all the way back. This is the children of promise. And you know the life of Abraham and Sarah and, and, and as we go on. It says in Romans 9, that is those who are the children of the flesh, are n these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also is conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. And it was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. In Galatians 4, 28, Paul wrote, Now you brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are the children of promise. Notice the children of promise. And these, genera these generations show the favor of God toward the family of Abraham. It shows the favor of God toward the family of Shem. It, it shows the favor of God towards the family of Noah all the way back. God's favor is bigger than we realize. That ends our Torah portion for today. There's a, many hundreds of years covered in all of that. Well, let's go to the half Torah now and see what it says here in Isaiah 54 and 55. And talk, it's talking about the, the children of Israel, the, of the Jews are exiled. And the question is, will God be angry forever? Will the favor of God ever come back on his own people whom he sent into exile for their sin and their wickedness? The Haftorah for Noah comes from the prophet Isaiah. God's promise of the redemption of Israel is based on the same covenantal strength as his promise to keep the earth from another worldwide flood. This is like the days of Noah to me, as I swore that, I, that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and will not rebuke you. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you, and my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says Jehovah, who has compassion on you, it's Isaiah 54. So we look at this. This is God's message for the exiles returning to the land. God's love is there, and he's trying to reconcile himself to his people. It says, enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left, and your descendants will possess the nations and will repopulate the deserted towns. For this is like the waters of Noah to me, for I have sworn with the waters of Noah who would no longer cover the earth. So have I sworn that I would not be angry with you nor rebuke you, for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant 
my covenant of peace be removed, says Jehovah, who has mercy on you. For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed. This is a prophetic statement about the abolishment of the system of sacrifices at the temple as the means of worshiping God. He is, assur he is assuring his people that although that will happen, his love and his covenant will still be with his people. The altars we were talking about earlier, they're not necessarily anymore. We now rely on the ultimate sacrifice the Father would himself would have self provided when he sacrificed his son on the cross. And just like God's covenant with all creatures of the earth he made with Noah, this is this is an eternal covenant. And we see that it's about this affliction is spoken of in Isaiah 54, 11 and 12. Behold, I will lay your stones with colorful gems and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of rubies, your gates of crystal, and all your walls of precious stones. So we're going back to the Abraham, the father of our faith, who was very blessed. And we bless the seed of Abraham. We bless all that God has. And the blessing comes by faith. It says, by faith. He went to live in the land of promise. And speaking of Abram, by faith, he went to, the, to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, the promise that comes through faith. He was looking for a city which, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So we see this is talking about heavenly Jerusalem. It's talking about real Jerusalem. It's talking about real blessings for the family of God. It's talking about the favor of God for God's people. Paul wrote about this in, when we talk about the Jewish people and what about the Jewish people in Romans chapters 12, 9 through 11. Just as the generation of the flood had sinned and yet a remnant was saved, so too God has preserved a remnant for himself and will one day bring about the complete salvation of the nation of Israel. The barren one will then bear innumerable children, people of faith from all nations, and will break forth in great singing and joy. Remember it says in Isaiah 54, 17, No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. As righteous, a righteousness from God is revealed here. It says, Paul wrote of this, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. That is the only way to receive the favor of God, to receive salvation, is through believing in what Jesus the Messiah did for us. God presented Jesus to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. Hebrews 11, 7, again, we read, By faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. In Isaiah 55, this is talking about a perpetual covenant of peace between God and God's people. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The sure mercies of David. Indeed, I have given him as a witness to the people a leader and commander for the people, and I will make you a leader and a commander as well. Surely you, surely you will, uh, nations who you know not, and nations that you do not know, you will hasten to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. 
Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. To our God, for he will freely pardon. Indeed, of the, of the thorn bush will grow the juniper, and instead of briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be for the Lord's renown, for an everlasting sign that will endure forever. So thorns and briars indicate a land that was cursed. The juniper or the cypress was used in construction of the temple, indicating Jerusalem. The myrtle was included in the four species used to celebrate Sukkot, indicating the gathering of all the nations. It says in Revelation 22, 3 and 4, There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. He, it, in Revelation 3, 21, it's, remember, He who overcomes to him I will give to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat with my father on his throne. This is the favor of God that is given by promise of God to his people. And we see this as, as thoroughly given to us in the story of Noah. So understanding that in all of this, when we come to the Lord and we realize whose family we are, we realize what our heritage is, we realize that the promises of God are yea and amen. The favor of God is upon us, and he's wanting to do a new thing with us. But we have to understand the huge scope of all that he is doing for us and in us and through us. And we are part of something that is much bigger than we ever realized. And understand that just like the name of Noah means rest, we need to learn how to enter into his rest as well. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. I'm sorry for my scratchy voice. I'm just getting over a sickness. And I and have a great week, and we'll talk to you again next week. This is Pastor Roy, and this has been Torah Tuesday.